Welcome to Leaping Larry's Revolutionary Reading Theatre. All right, we are doing the reading. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. We are doing the reading. And uh, today we are reading more of Stalin, Foundations of Leninism, which you can get a link to if you'd like to follow along right here. And we are on chapter seven of this work. I would have been friends with Stalin. A lot of commentary for this chapter. True, I would be. But just by necessity of, of sort of what they're talking about here. But uh, I think this is still, of course, a very interesting chapter as well. So let us begin. Strategy and Tactics. From this theme, I take six questions. A. Strategy and Tactics is the science of leadership in the class struggle of the proletariat. B. Stages of the revolution and strategy. C. The flow and ebb of the movement and tactics. D. Strategic leadership. E. Tactical leadership. And F. Reformism and revolutionism. Dude Coyote, welcome in, comrade. I hope you're well. 1. Strategy and tactics is the science of leadership in the class struggle of the proletariat. The period of the domination of the Second International was mainly a period of the reformation and training of the proletarian political armies under conditions of more or less peaceful development. It was the period of parliamentarism and the predominant form of the class struggle. Questions of great class conflicts, of preparing the proletariat for revolutionary clashes, of the means for achieving the dictatorship of the proletariat, did not seem to be on the order of the day at that time. The task was confined to utilizing all means of legal development for the purpose of forming and training the proletarian armies, utilizing parliamentarism in conformity with the conditions under which the status of the proletariat remained and, as it seemed, had to remain that of an opposition. It scarcely needs proof that in such a period and with such a conception of the task of the proletariat, there could be either neither an integral strategy nor any elaborated tactics. There were fragmentary and detached ideas about tactics and strategy, but no tactics or strategy as such. The mortal sin of the Second International was not that it pursued at that time the tactics of utilizing parliamentary forms of struggle, but that it overestimated the importance of these forms, that it considered them virtually the only forms, and that when the period of open revolutionary battle set in, and the question of extra-parliamentary form of struggle came to the fore, the parties of the Second International turned their backs on these new tasks, refused to shoulder them. Only in the subsequent period, the period of direct action by the proletariat, the period of proletarian revolution, when the question of overthrowing the bourgeoisie became a question of immediate practical action, when the question of the reserves of the proletariat, strategy, became one of the most burning tack questions, when all forms of struggle and organization, parliamentary and extra-parliamentary tactics, had quite clearly manifested themselves. Only in this period could an integral strategy and elaborated tactics for the struggle of the proletariat be worked out. It was precisely in this period that Lenin brought out into the light of day the brilliant ideas of Marx and Engels on tactics and strategy that 
had been suppressed by the opportunists of the Second International. But Lenin did not confine himself to restoring the particular tactical propositions of Marx and Engels. He developed them further and supplemented them with new ideas and propositions, combining them all into a system of rules and guiding principles for the leadership of the class struggle of the proletariat. Lenin's pamphlet, What is to be Done? Two Tactics, Imperialism, the State and Revolution, the Proletarian Revolution, and the Renegade Kotsky, left-wing communism, undoubtedly constitute priceless contributions to the general treasury of Marxism, to its revolutionary arsenal. The strategy and tactics of Leninism constitute the science of leadership in the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat. 2. The Stages of Revolution and Strategy Strategy is the determination of the direction of the main blow of the proletariat at a given stage of the revolution. The elaboration of a corresponding plan for the disposition of the revolutionary forces, main and secondary reserves. The fight to carry out this plan throughout the given stage of the revolution. Our revolution had already passed through two stages, and after the October Revolution, it entered a third one. Our strategy changed accordingly. First stage, 1903 to February 1917. Objective, to overthrow Tsarism and completely wipe out the survivals of medievalism. The main force of the revolution, the proletariat, immediate reserves, the peasantry. Direction of the main blow? The isolation of the liberal monarchist bourgeoisie, which was striving to win over the peasantry and liquidate the revolution by compromise with Tsarism. Plan for the disposition of forces. Alliance of the working class with the peasantry. The proletariat must carry to completion the democratic revolution by allying to itself the mass of the peasantry in order to crush by force the resistance of the autocracy and to paralyze the instability of the bourgeoisie. Lenin. Second stage, March 1917 to October 1917. Objective, to overthrow imperialism in Russia and to withdraw from the imperialist war. The main force of the revolution, the proletariat. Immediate reserves, the poor peasantry. The proletariat of neighboring countries as probable reserves. The protracted war and the crisis of imperialism is a favorable factor. Direction of the main blow, isolation of the petty bourgeois Democrats, Mensheviks, and socialist revolutionaries, who were striving to win over the toiling masses of the peasantry and to put an end to the revolution by a compromise with imperialism. Plan for the disposition of forces, alliance of the proletariat with the poor peasantry. The proletariat must accomplish the socialist revolution by allying to itself the mass of the semi-proletarian elements of the population in order to crush by force the resistance of the bourgeoisie and to paralyze the instability of the peasantry and the petty bourgeoisie. Lenin. Third stage. Began after the October Revolution. Objective to consolidate the dictatorship of the proletariat in one country, using it as a base for the defeat of imperialism in all countries. The revolution spreads beyond the confines of one country. The epoch of world revolution has begun. The main force of the revolution, the dictatorship of the proletariat in one country. The revolutionary movement of the proletariat in all countries. Main reserves, the semi-proletarian, and the small peasant masses in the developed countries. The liberation movements of the colonies and dependent countries. Direction of the main blow. Isolation of the petty bourgeois democrats. Isolation of the parties of the Second International, which constitute the main support of the policy of compromise with imperialism. Plan for the disposition of forces, alliance of the proletarian revolution, with the liberation movement in the colonies and the dependent countries. 
strategy deals with the main force of the revolution and the reserves, but it changes with the passing of the revolution from one stage to another, but remains basically unchanged throughout a given stage. 3. The flow and ebb of the movement and tactics. Tactics are the determination of the line of conduct of the proletariat in the comparatively short period of the flow or ebb of the movement, of the rise or decline of the revolution. The fight to carry out this line by means of replacing old forms of struggle and organization by new ones, old slogans by new ones, by com combining these forms, etc. Well, the object of strategy is to win the war against Tsarism, let us say, or against the bourgeoisie, to carry through the struggle against Tsarism or against the bourgeoisie to its end. Tactics pursue less important objects, for their aim is not the winning of the war as a whole, but the winning of some particular engagements or some particular battles, the carrying through successfully of some particular campaigns or actions corresponding to the concrete circumstances in a given period or rise or decline of the revolution. Tactics are part of strategy, subordinate to it and serving it. Tactics change according to flow and ebb. While the strategic plan, while the strategic plan remained unchanged during the first stage of the revolution, 1903 to February 1917, tactics changed several times during that period. In the period from 1903 to 1905, the party pursued offensive tactics, for the tide of the revolution was rising. The movement was on the upgrade, and tactics had to proceed from this fact. Accordingly, the forms of struggle were revolutionary, corresponding to the requirements of the rising tide of the revolution. Local political strikes, political demonstrations, the politi general political strike, boycott of the Duma, uprising, revolutionary fighting slogans, such were the successive forms of struggle during that period. These changes in the forms of struggle were accomplished by corresponding changes in the forms of organization. Factory committees, revolutionary peasant committees, strike committees, Soviets of workers, deputies, a workers, party operating more or less openly, such were the forms of organization during that period. In the period from 1907 to 1912, the party was compelled to resort to tactics of retreat. For we then experienced a decline in the revolutionary movement. The ebb of the revolution and tactics necessarily had to take this fact into consideration. The forms of struggle, as well as the forms of organization, changed accordingly. Instead of the boycott of the Duma, participation in the Duma. Instead of open revolutionary actions outside the Duma, actions and work in the Duma. Instead of general political strikes, partial economic strikes, or simply a lull in activities. Of course, the party had to go underground that period while the revolutionary mass organizations were replaced by cultural, educational, cooperative, insurance, and other legal organizations. The same must be said of the second and third stages of the revolution, during which tactics changed dozens of times, whereas the strategic plan remained unchanged. Tactics deal with the forms of struggle and the forms of organization of the proletariat with their changes and combinations during a given stage of the revolution, tactics may change several times, depending on the flow or ebb, the rise or decline of the revolution. Four, strategic leadership. The reserves of the revolution can be direct, A, a peasantry or in general, the intermediate strata of the population within the country. B. The proletariat of neighboring countries. C. The revolutionary movement in the colonies and dependent countries. And D. 
the conquests and gains of the dictatorship of the proletariat, part of which the proletariat may give up temporarily, while retaining superiority of forces, in order to buy off a powerful enemy and gain a respite, which is exactly what the period of new economic period was, the period of market socialism represents this period in the revolution. D. The conquests and gains of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Sorry, part of the proletariat may give up temporarily while retaining superiority of forces in order to buy off a powerful enemy and gain a respite. That is what the NEP period was. And indirect. A. The contradictions and conflicts of the non-proletarian classes within the country which can be utilized by the proletariat to weaken the enemy and to strengthen its own reserves. B. Contradictions, conflicts, and wars. The imperialist war, for instance, among the bourgeois states hostile to the proletarian state, which can be utilized by the proletariat in its offensive or in maneuvering in the event of a forced retreat. There is no need to speak at length about the reserves in the first category as their significance is clear to everyone. As for the reserves of the second category, whose significance is not clear, it must be said that sometimes they are of prime importance for the progress of revolution. One can hardly deny that the enormous importance, for example, of the conflicts between the petty bourgeois democrats, socialist revolutionaries, and the liberal monarchist bourgeoisie, the cadets, during and after the first revolution, which undoubtedly played its part in freeing the peasantry from the influence of the bourgeoisie. Still less reason is there for denying the colossal importance of the fact that the principal groups of imperialists were engaged in a deadly war during the period of the October Revolution, when the imperialists, engrossed in war among themselves, were unable to concentrate their forces against the young Soviet power and the proletariat, for this very reason, was able to get down to the work of organizing its forces and consolidating its power, and to prepare the route of Kolchak and Denikin. It must be presumed that now, when the contradictions among the imperialist groups are becoming more and more profound, and when a new war among them is becoming inevitable, reserves of this description will assume ever greater importance for the proletariat. Now. Something that must be said here is, as we know from reading Juche previously and, and reading Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, something uh, that did end up happening that we have to understand is that actually the bourgeoisie has also learned this lesson. And they have learned to not um, enter the imperialist bourgeoisie, has learned to not enter into open armed conflicts with each other. And so this is why in, in the world we have today, you have all the imperialist countries being led by one imperialist power, the United States. And that's why there is, no, there is no imperialist power that exists outside of that sphere. Because that sphere moves whenever it has to, to keep any other power, whether it's socialist or not, from threatening its hegemonic position. Not just the U.S., but their white European imperialist power, essentially. They have to make sure that there is no competing power to this. And so they settle their differences no longer with open armed conflicts. And instead, they concentrate all of their, their military fighting force, essentially, for fighting against any movements which, which threaten that. Which is exactly what we see happened ever since what we call the Cold War, right? Ever since the, the outbreak of the Cold War, you see this, you also see this like uh, this, this inter-imperialist alliance where, where they are, where they're uh, competing to make sure, where they're making sure that there's no, uh, that there's no like socialist power emerging to, to compete against it. Open inter-imperialist conflict has also brought about creation of major socialist powers every time it has happened, exactly, Marge, which is why they are very careful. Now, of course, the, the, the funny thing is, though, 
in response to them doing what they do now with a lot allying together and preventing any sort of, of change, what that also is doing is heightening the contradictions of the imperialist system itself and making imperialism even more like naked. You know what I mean? So it, it so that it becomes it, as it goes on it, it, like it is, it becomes less and less tolerable for for countries to accept this arrangement. Less and less tolerable among their own people who will overthrow them if they continue to accept this, which we see happening like for in Africa, right? Like I, I do think that definitely that the law that that Marx laid out that imperialism is digs its own grave still applies, right? It's just that they have learned their lesson. They had thought they learned their lesson that okay, if we enter into open inter imperialist conflict with each other, we open the swing open the door for revolutions to succeed. And while that's true, also. Their reaction and allying together to stamp out any sort of independence movements, regardless of whether they're explicitly socialist or not, um, makes their their hypocrisy even stronger, right? And makes like what they're makes what they're doing, their evil deeds, even more noticeable, and even more like bare naked. So while they did try and respond, it still won't save the imperialist system if you will. And of course, we know that the response for imperialist powers, the, the way to fight against this for anti-imperialist powers in general is to become closer and to ally together, right? To, to draw closer in their ties and militancy and, and solidarity with each other, which is what we, again, see happening. What, what they're calling... What some people call the multipolar world, I kind of, I don't, I don't like that term. I think it's, I think it's kind of like, I don't know. It's like very simplistic and, and not really like that accurate of what's happened. Like multipolar, sure, I, I guess, but not really, right? Like China's not trying to become a new like pole in that sense. Like, really what's happening is the emergence of a democratic world, right? What we see is, is the contest between the wealth and power of capitalism and imperialism on one end and the struggle for, for justice of humanity on the other end, essentially. So I kind of don't like the term, like, multipolar world. It's very, like... I don't know. It's very like lib coded. You know what I mean? Like we understand like what we're not fighting for like a like a, a multipolar world. We're fighting for liberation. Like China's not fighting to become a world power. It's fighting for liberation. You know? That makes sense at all? It's just one term that I see a lot of people use and I just don't necessarily think it's all that useful for describing the situation that we're headed towards. The, strat the task of strategic leadership is to make proper use of all these reserves for the achievement of the main objective of the revolution at the given stage of its development. What does making proper use of reserves mean? It means fulfilling certain necessary conditions of which the following must be regarding as the principal ones. You think? I hope I'm making sense there. I just think multipolar is like, it's like the way liberals describe the world during like USSR times again. And, and it was like, and I still thought it was kind of like a, a, a way to sort of like discredit what the USSR and what liberation movements actually do is a way of saying like, look, you have you have China or USSR, or whatever socialist country influencing all of these other countries, right? You know what I mean? It's like, it's sort of like, the, it's, it is a lot like that. Like the way we thought about it before, like think about it, the way they portrayed USSR before was you had the Cold War was always presented as like 
Russia was influencing these countries and USA and, and NATO was influencing these countries. Multipolar, you know, when really that's not what it was. That's, that's really a liberal viewpoint that's looking from a bourgeois perspective. Because really what was happening was you had all of these liberation movements trying to free themselves from imperialism and USSR and, and other socialist countries lending aid when they're able to and NATO doing everything they can to stop a revolutionary movement from succeeding. The communism, right? Like, there's no need for us to adopt liberal terms and liberal slogans that have no practical use in our actual revolution. Yeah, a non-polar world, a Democrat. That's why I say Redispi. Like, I, I think of it as, like, really what we're seeing is not the emergence of a multipolar world, so to speak, but a emergence of a democratic world order is what we, the struggle. It's very early, and of course, the, the imperialist powers are still very strong, but we can see the democratic struggle going on. And in fact, like in bodies such as the UN, we literally saw like that playing out, how it started with a very perfect imperialist tool, and through the course, and while it's still very, it's of course still imperialist tool, the reason it has been distorted the amount that it had is through the struggle of, of nations to achieve um, to achieve like a, some democratic say in that, right? It's just whenever you think of polar uh, uh, polarity or a, a polar world, we're talking about like hegemony, right? And and I think that again that you're playing into like liberal sentiments of calling like like portraying socialist countries as just having the same the same um goals and the same interests as capitalist countries and again while i always say that these countries are not perfect they make they make mistakes they they they're the they they can cr make some serious crimes even right but the point is that they have a different set of interests that guides their development than capitalist countries do. And uh, because they are led by working masses, the morality guiding those countries does more align with their own morality. And socialists who like, and communists who like are afraid of talking about morality confuse the fuck out of me, you know? Like, I always see that. Like, you're making a moral statement. Like, yeah, we, I kind of am. But, like, the thing, the thing is, people do have morals, and, and morality does have a class character. And, and working class morality, you know, it's, it's very simple and very well. It's independence. It's survival of humanity. It's equality. We know what they are. We've been struggling for them for a long time. I really don't think we need more than one Poland. Exactly. Hey, Kay, welcome in, comrade. All right. I told you I wasn't going to rant much, and here I am, ranting. <laughs> Firstly, the concentration of the main forces of the revolution at the enemy's most vulnerable spot at the decisive moment. When the revolution has already become ripe. When the offensive is going full steam ahead. When insurrection is knocking at the door. And when bringing the reserves up to the vanguard is the decisive condition of success. The party strategy during the period from April to October 1917 can be taken in, as an example of this. Manner of utilizing reserves. Excuse me. Undoubtedly, the enemy's most vulnerable spot at that time was the war. Undoubtedly, it was on this question as the fundamental one that the party rallied the broadest masses of the population around the proletarian vanguard. The party's strategy during that period was, while training the vanguard for street action by means of manifestations and demonstrations, to bring up the reserves up to the vanguard through the medium of Soviets in the rear 
and the soldiers' committees at the front. The outcome of the revolution has shown that the reserves were properly utilized. Here is what Lenin, paraphrasing the well-known thesis of Marx and Engels on insurrection, says about this condition of the strategic utilization of the forces of revolution. 1. Never play with insurrection, but when beginning it, firmly realize that you must go to the end. 2. Concentrate a great superiority of forces at the decisive point, at the decisive moment. Otherwise, the enemy, who has the advantage of better preparation and organization, will destroy the insurgents. 3. Once the insurrection has begun, you must act with the greatest determination, and by all means, without fail, take the offensive. The defensive is the death of every armed uprising. 4. You must try to take the enemy by surprise and seize the moment when his forces are scattered. And 5. The revolution that feeds the children gets my support. Hey, Lasu, welcome in, welcome in. And number 5. You must strive for daily success. Even if small, one might say hourly. To say that socialism doesn't work is to overlook the fact that it did work and it worked for hundreds of millions if of people. It is the case of one town and at all costs retain the moral ascendancy. Lenin. Welcome in, Sue. Great to see you. Shout out for Long live Sue. the paper's revolution! Thank you, thank you. Secondly, the selection of the moment for the decisive blow. Of the moment for starting the insurrection so timed as to coincide with the moment when the crisis has reached its climax, when it has already the case that the vanguard is prepared to fight to the end, the reserves are prepared to support the vanguard, and the maximum consternation reigns in the ranks of the enemy. The decisive battle, says Lenin, may be deemed to have fully matured if, one, all the class forces hostile to us have become sufficiently entangled or sufficiently at loggerheads, have sufficiently weakened themselves in a struggle which is beyond their strength. Everybody follow La Sue, by the way. If, too, all the facilitating, wavering, unstable, immediate, intermediate elements of the petty bourgeois, the petty bourgeois democrats, as distinct from the bourgeoisie, have sufficiently exposed themselves in the eyes of the people have sufficiently disgraced themselves through their practical bankruptcy. If three, among the proletariat, a mass of, a mass sentiment. Hold on one second, hot dog, what do you mean? If three, among the proletariat, a mass sentiment in favor of supporting the most determined, supremely bold, revolutionary action against the bourgeoisie has arisen and begun vigorously to grow, then revolution is indeed ripe. Then indeed, if we have correctly gauged all the conditions above, and if we have chosen the moment rightly, our victory is assured. Lenin The manner in which the October uprising was carried out may be taken as a model of such strategy. I will get to your question in just one second, okay? Hot dog, just sit tight. I mean, there are communist parties in the West, but they have no support at all. For example, Canada has one, but they have zero seats in Parliament. Yeah, there's a very good reason for that. I mean, uh, I will get to you. I will get to you. Just let me finish this section, okay? Just so I'm at, like at a definite, a definite pause. When it come, but uh, to to answer briefly about can uh, communist parties here, uh, the problem is they're shit and actually anti-communist parties, and it's very hard to to gain support when you're not doing anything that looks any different than what the other bourgeois parties are doing. Like like I always say, like my my critique of of CPC and 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 uh, PSL, besides a lot of problems in their programs, which I've pointed out in the past. Uh, one of the major problems with them, of course, is that they they are stuck on just participating in like bourgeois 
parliamentarism a lot of times, especially the case for the Communist Party of Canada. And instead of like uh, building actual dual power as one would in, in a revolutionary struggle, they essentially just put forward their goals and their program and expect people to just believe it and, and support that. And that's not really a strategy that has worked for socialism in the past, right? The, the, the way that we build a revolution, of course, is we know, for example, in the U.S., let's take the U.S., right? In the U.S., we know that uh, they have shit health care, right? They, we know that there's people that go hungry or without sufficient food, so on and so forth. So what a communist party, what a real revolutionary party should do is build forms of services like healthcare services that can meet people's needs who are not being sufficiently met by the existing state organs and combine that with educating people about revolution and, and socialism. And what this does is it teaches people, it, it teaches people about exactly like where um, the rev revolutionary forces are and where the hypocrisy is from the state and draws them nearer to the revolution. Like, of course, revolution is the solution, but we have to understand that re revolution is simply like people asking for, asking for fundamental change, asking for their needs, asking for their interests to be the thing which guides society rather than uh, the greedy interests of the bourgeoisie who only care about one thing. Right. And don't let P and don't let the word revolution fool you like revolution is, is simply getting rid of a sickness in society. Right. It's getting rid of capitalism, the sickness that's that's infecting our society. Revolution is only violent because those who have all the power and the influence refuse to uh, step aside despite becoming a hindrance on the development of humanity. So there you go. Oh, I will continue this read. And I think chat can help from there. If not, at the end of the read, we can continue talking. Failure to observe this condition leads to a dangerous error called loss of tempo. When the party lags behind the movement or runs far ahead of it, courting the danger of failure. An example of such loss of temple is of how, of how the moment for an uprising should be chosen may be seen in an attempt made by a section of our comrades to begin the uprising by arresting the Democratic Conference on September 1917. when wavering was still apparent in the Soviets, when the armies at the front were still at the crossroads, when the reserves had not yet been brought up to the vanguard. Yes, 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 that's true. That is a, you, you are correct, Hot Dog, in saying that that is a very hard problem to solve. Most, a, a lot of working class people are indeed um, reactionary because they have been programmed to think that way by their schools by their media, right? And that's why we understand, that's why that we, we understand that what is needed is, of course, we, that's why we believe in a vanguard. We, we need dedicated revolutionaries who can um, understand how to make a revolution happen without necessarily all of the masses being convinced of communism. That's not something that we're going to be able to do before the achievement of a socialist society. It sounds paradoxical, but it's not actually. And this is the mistake that the anarchists make, right? The, the mistake of anarchists is thinking that, oh, well, all we have to do is first convince everybody to become communist people, and then we'll have an anarchist society. No, we need state power in order to have the, the necessary influence and the necessary... Um, the necessary power. We need the state to have the necessary power to re-educate people. Because before having state power, we have the problem of, again, the, 
the bourgeois state, which controls education, which controls the media, which constantly will reprogram and will constantly try to fool the proletariat. We'll try to lead them down these reactionary alleys, right? So yeah, the, 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 uh, the question of transforming humanity comes to the fore not before the revolution, but during the revolution. And in every single place where re revolution has succeeded, it wasn't because all the people became communist people. It's because the Communist Party was putting forward um, the, the best program as proven by their practice, was the only one serving the people in instances where, where nobody else was. And so they gained large amounts of support. But that didn't mean that all the people were communist. And in fact, one failing of the USSR was a lack of ideological education during the revolution, which is what led to confusion among their, the people there. Instead of where, instead of overthrowing the entire socialist system, they would have, you know, gotten rid of counter-revolutionaries. But the point of Marxism is to eliminate her hierarchy? No. No, Mar Ma Marxism never has no, there's no reason. To, no, <laughs> no, it doesn't. You're thinking of anarchism. Marxism is not about eliminating hierarchy. It's about political equality. Yes, but that doesn't, that does not mean, that doesn't mean that there's no like hierarchy. It's like, how can you, like, take the example of a ship or a fucking airplane, right? Like, how are you going to sail a ship without there being hierarchy on that ship? You know, you're going you're gonna to have a whole bunch of captains. Nobody's going to be steering the ship in the proper direction. We're not for, we're not against hierarchy. And we're not against, we're not against centralization. We're, we're for the proper combination of democracy and centralism. And we also understand that, uh, that democracy is also a form of a state. And we understand that the socialist state is not necessarily perfect because the revolution is, is uh, not a dinner party. You know, it's a very serious matter. But so is capitalism and imperialism. And it, the, the pains of revolution are worth it to get rid of the, the oppression that uh, imperialism brings us. And not only that, of course, we know that imperialism, imperialism brings about the destruction of humanity if we allow it to continue. So what do we mean by the dictatorship of the proletariat? It seems like you're talking about a dictatorship of the Politburo. <laughs> no, a dictatorship of the Politburo. <laughs> It's funny. That's a funny one. But no, no. Um, the, the Politburo or the, the parties, the party bureaus and stuff like this, they, they didn't actually have legislative say, right? Like, like uh, if you take uh, China or, or DPRK today, the way the Communist Party leads is through ideological education by having those ideological means of reformation that I mentioned. But ultimately, the people who set all the law, laws and the people who execute, it, execute the laws are just the people. Like, take the example of uh, DPRK, for example. It's not Kim Jong-un, it's not the party that sets laws, and it's not the party that executes any of the laws. It's the Supreme People's Assembly that sets all the laws, all constitutional changes, so on and so forth. And it's the cabinet that implement that ex executes them. They are separate bodies from the party. Because in any socialist society, every single political party is actually independent of the, the state bodies. No, they didn't. On paper, true, but they also had full control over the military, the police, etc. No, you're you were incorrect.
You were incorrect about them having full control over those things, as proven by the very, by the very fact that Yeltsin, <laughs> Yeltsin overthrew the socialist system using the police, despite the protests of most of the members of the Communist Party. Not to mention the people, who literally were in the streets trying to fucking stop that from happening. He fucking shelled the goddamn parliament. Using this ar using the army. Showing they did not have control. Not only that, the whole fucking... The whole shit with Yezov, I, I recommend, like... If you actually want to learn something, I, I can't tell if you're trolling or not at this point. Right? I can't really tell if you're trolling or not, but I will say that I... Okay, but let's talk about before the dissolution of the USSR then. How about you have a look at this? I, I, I invite you to look at this one right here, which really provides some fucking solid arguments and evidence for the fact that what went on with what is known as the period of the mass repressions, the Great Terror between 1937 and 38, is also the result of the party not having control of, of the army. Right? Well, of course you learn about you because you, like any other worker, is programmed with anti-communist narratives about USSR. Of course you've learned different things about it. I learned probably the same things you did, and then I had to unpro I had to relearn all of these things myself through studying this shit, right? I mean, Stalin himself tried to step down three, four fucking times. And each time he was refused. Because Stalin didn't have even absolute power in his own party. So, for example, the Central Committee ordered the Red Army to invade Hungary in 1956, right? It wasn't the working class. Um, Hungary? You're talking about, you're talking about an uprising of, of petty bourgeois. The, there was no invasion of Hungary. Like, what are you talking about? There was petty bourgeois enemies trying to restore capitalism. And so at the request of the people, the Red Army came in. That's what the Red Army did. It wasn't a revolution. The Hungarian revolution, as you call it, was a bunch of fucking petty bourgeois capitalists wanting the restoration of capitalism. It was literally a cap. Yeah, it was. It was literally a counter revolution. It was literally people trying to overthrow the power of the proletariat. And the proletariat using their army to come in and stop them. <laughs> Boo -hoo. I'm so sad for all those, all those little capitalists who were fucking murdering and burning fucking people before. Yes, yes, so fucking sad. No, you are you are incorrect. which was not acceptable to the USSR, so they hanged him. What are you talking about? I think you're very confused. I think you're very, very confused. I'm gonna let chat continue with you because I do want to continue on with her reading. So I'll let chat continue with things. Just you keep it civil and I don't mind the conversation. Just if, if you're not here to learn though, you will, you will be blocked. Like if, if you're here to, if these, if you're generally trying, genuinely trying to learn, I have no problem with that. Just search 
I'm not searching that. I'm trying to read a fucking book. Did you miss that part? I've spent the last half hour now just talking to you in particular. That's an example. I'm trying to give you other examples. No, you're doing what a typical anti-communist does is you're pretending like you want to learn and you're just coming in listing things over and over again now. Like, we can go through every specific event if you want, but you ask me a generalized question. And right now, I'm not going to go through every specific fucking event like this with you. Uh, you know? Like, at some point, you're going to have to accept that perhaps what you've been told about the USSR or the Hungarian Revolution by bourgeois mainstream media and the mainstream background assumptions is a lie. That might be a good place to start. And the fact that you haven't even considered that with yourself is really not giving me a lot of confidence in you being here actually trying to learn. But that's just, that's just my read so far. So I'm going to continue my read and... Uh, Again, be respectful. I don't mind if you ask questions and uh, chat can answer you. Just don't expect me to answer you until I'm done reading this. This is my stream and you're welcome here, but you have to follow my route. My... Well, I just told you they learned. Here, here, let me help you. Let me just help you, hot dog, real quick. Here's, here's a good, here's a... Let me show you a little thing that I think uh, really makes it nice and clear for you, okay? Here we go. We're taught at such an early age to be against the communists. Yet, most of us don't have the faintest idea what communism is. Only a fool lets somebody else tell him who his enemy is. And so when the bourgeois media are telling you that it's actually, it's actually the revolutionaries that are your enemy and these, and these counter-revolutionaries trying to restore capitalism are your friends, you should maybe uh, think about that, right? No one is going to give you the education you need to overthrow them. Nobody is going to teach you your true heroes. If they know that knowledge will help set you free. Schools in America are interested in brainwashing people with Americanism. Giving them a little bit of education and training them in skills needed to fill the positions the capitalist system requires. As long as we expect America's schools to educate us, we will remain ignorant. So how about, there's a start for you. So yes, everything you've been taught about USSR in school, in history textbooks, is, is pretty much 99% lies. So, uh, extra, like, I, I invite you to be the free thinker that so many liberals like to, to prattle on about being. Actually be that free thinker and consider the fact that so far everything you have ever learned about a socialist state or communist movement is a lie. Sold to you by the capitalists who are more afraid of communism than anybody else. And with that, I will continue this reading. A lifetime of study, hot dog. A lifetime of study has taught me that. I mean, right now, if you can't, like, just think about the hypocrisy with the U.S. and Israel. Look at the fucking Soviet archives when they open. When, CI, when we found documents and shit where it's the CI admits that people in the USSR had similar calorie intake, but better nutrition than people in the States. 
There's countless examples. What the fuck? Anyway, let me continue. Thirdly, undeviating pursuit of the course adopted. No matter what difficulties and complications are encountered on the road towards the goal. This is necessary in order that the vanguard may not lose sight of the main goal of the struggle and that the masses may not stray from the road while marching towards that goal and striving to rally around the vanguard. Failure to observe this condition leads to a grave error, well known to sailors as losing one's bearing. As an example of this losing one's bearing, we may take the erroneous conduct of our party when, immediately after the Democratic Conference, it adopted a resolution to participate in the pre-parliament. For the moment, the party, as it were, forgot that the pre-parliament was an attempt of the bourgeoisie to switch the country from the path of the Soviets to the path of boudoir parliamentarism. And the party, that the party's participation in such a party might result in mixing everything up and confusing the workers and peasants who were waging a revolutionary struggle under the slogan, All Power to the Soviets. This mistake was rectified by the withdrawal of the Bolsheviks from the parliament. Fourthly, maneuvering the reserves with a view to effecting a proper retreat when the enemy is strong, when retreat is inevitable, when to accept battle force upon us by the enemy is obviously disadvantageous, when, with the given relation of forces, retreat becomes the only way to escape a blow against the vanguard, and to retain the reserves for the latter. The revolutionary parties, says Lenin, must complete their education. They must learn to attack. Now they have to realize that this knowledge must be supplemented with the knowledge how to retreat properly. They have to realize, and the revolutionary class is taught to realize it by their, its own bitter experience, that victory is impossible unless they have learned both how to attack and how to retreat properly. Lenin The object of this strategy is to gain time, to disrupt the enemy, and to accumulate forces in order to later assume the offensive. The signing of the Brett's Peace may be taken as a model of this strategy, for it enabled the party to gain time, to take advantage of the conflicts in the camp of the imperialists, to disrupt the forces of the enemy, to retain the support of the peasantry, and to accumulate forces in preparation for the offensive against Kolchak and Denikin. In concluding a separate peace, said Lenin at that time, we free ourselves as much as possible at the present moment from both warring imperialist groups. We take advantage of their mutual enmity and warfare, which hinder them from making a deal against us, and for a certain period have our hands free to advance and to consolidate the socialist revolution. Lenin. Now, even the biggest fool, said Lenin, three years after the Brest Peace, can see that the Brest Peace was a concession that strengthened us and broke up the forces of international imperialism. Such are the principal conditions which ensure correct strategic leadership. Because again, well, it, the, and the, the reason for this, the strategic leadership, as we know, like to put it in plainer English, to, to put it down to like layman's terms, I guess we could say, in, in terms of... Uh, Think about what we learned from Juche, right? That the way the working class revolution leads is not by orders and decrees. That the only way the working class can, the only way the working, the revolutionary party can lead the working class is uh, by first winning their support. And that it has to maintain their support all throughout the revolution. And the moment it loses the support of the people, is the moment the revolution fails. And what what makes any let, let me ask you something from the other day. What makes the people what makes the population obliged to fulfill and and to follow the revolutionary party? Does anybody know? 
Does anybody know what obliges the masses and the, the, the general population? What obliges them to follow the Revolutionary Party? Wait, trying to find the proper one. The thing that obliges people to follow and support the party is trust. Because trust is the spiritual source of love and obligation. Remember, it's the, the, the capitalist party can lead by orders and decrees because it has capital. It has money. Right, which it can use to influence people. The party cannot do this. And the reason the party cannot do this is because all things in a socialist society are invested back into the people. So the party doesn't have money for bribing, you see. So the way the party becomes a leader is by gaining the trust of the masses. The way the party maintains its position as the leader of the revolution is 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 by maintaining their trust and consolidating their trust number five tactical leader leadership not to be confused with strategic leadership tactical leadership is part of strategic leadership it's subordinated to the tasks and the requirements of the latter. Remember, just like the difference between tactics and strategy. The task of tactical leadership is to master all the forms of struggle and organize of the proletariat and to ensure that they are used properly so as to achieve with the... To given say that socialism forces. doesn't work is to overlook the fact that it did work and it worked for hundreds of millions of people. Thank you, Sue. Exactly. Parenti is right. The maximum results necessary to produce to prepare the strategic successes. What is meant by proper use of the forms of struggle and organization of the proletariat? It means fulfilling certain necessary conditions, of which the following must be regarded as the principal ones. Firstly, to put in the forefront precisely those forms of struggle and organization which are best suited to the conditions prevailing during the flow and ebb of the movement at a given moment and which therefore can facilitate and ensure the bringing of the masses to revolutionary positions and bringing of the millions to the revolutionary front and their disposition at the revolutionary front. The point here is not that the vanguard should realize the impossibility of preserving the old regime and the inevitability of its overthrow. The point is that the masses the million should understand this inevitability and display their readiness to support the vanguard. The, but the masses can only understand this from their own experience. The task of, is to enable the vast masses to realize from their own experience the inevitable. Uh, who do you think we're reading right now, hot dog? <laughs> I invite you to, to go like this, reading, oh wait, reading, and click on that work that we're reading right now, okay? The point here is not that the vanguard should realize the impossibility of preserving the old regime and the inevitability of its overthrow. The point is that the masses, the million, should understand this inevitability and display their readiness to support the vanguard. But the masses can understand this only from their own experience. The task is to enable the vast masses to realize from their own experience the inevitability of the overthrow of the old regime, to promote such methods of struggle and forms of organization as will make it easier for the masses to realize from experience the correctness of the revolutionary slogans.
the vanguard would have become detached from the working class, and the working class would have lost contact with the masses. If the party had not decided, as the time, to participate in the Duma, if it had not decided to concentrate its forces on work in the Duma and to develop a struggle on the basis of this work, in order to make it easier for the masses to realize from their own, from their own experience the futility of the Duma, the falsity of the promises of the cadets, the impossibility of the compromise with Tsarism, and the inevitability of an alliance between the peasantry and the working class. And this, by the way, is, I think, where, I think PSL, the way they participate in the revolution currently is an expression of them wrongly reading the stage of revolution in which they are at. Um, which I think is really, like, highlighted by, we had, we had, the U.S. had recent elections, uh, uh, recent Elections where the turnout was extremely, extremely low with huge amounts of people doing write-ins for like non-committed and stuff like this. And, you know, and still it's like, they still like, they still have the same strategy regarding, uh, regarding the elections as they did 10 years ago. What? Oh. Yep, that's that's enough of that. <laughs> Didn't write anything of his own. Come on. Yeah. See ya. You know what? I I've said this before though. I I have said this before and it's like the like the way they do they do that same thing with Kim Jong Il and stuff too, right? It's like, of course, probably other party members participated in writing this. Same with same with like other work. They there's no doubt lots of party members who contributed to and and Lenin himself contributed to Stalin being able to write this. But to but to ignore the fact that there are there are theorists and there are leaders who do write this stuff is to ignore revolutionary leadership altogether and to also have an undialectical understanding of the relationship between the leadership and the people. It's like, it's so silly that people just don't even want to like consider that at all, right? P th that people get very strange when it comes to leaders. Had the masses not gained their experience during that period of the Duma, the exposure of the cadets and the hegemony of the proletariat would have been impossible. Yeah, I figured too, Cinnamon. But, you know, I thought I'd give them a chance. I saw they were banned in I dance too. So that, that was my first red flag. But I thought, you know, I give everyone a little bit of a... I'll give you an inch. But when you try and take a mile... That's when you get banned. <laughs> the danger of the Otsovist tactics was that they threatened to detach the vanguard from the millions of its reserves. The party would have become detached from the working class, from the work, and the working class would have lost its influence among the broad masses of the peasants and soldiers if the proletariat had followed the left communists who called for an uprising in April 1917, when the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries had not yet exposed themselves as advocates of war and imperialism, when the masses had not yet realized from their own experience the falsity of speeches of the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries about peace, land, and freedom. Had the masses not gained this experience during the Kerensky period, the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries would not have been isolated, and the dictatorship of the proletariat would have been impossible. Therefore, the tactics of patiently explaining the mistakes of the petty bourgeois parties and of open struggle in the Soviets were the only correct tactics. The danger of the tactics of the left communists was that they threatened to transform the party from the leader of the proletarian revolution 
into a handful of futile conspirators with no ground to stand on. Victory cannot be won with the vanguard alone, says Lenin. To throw the vanguard alone into the decisive battle before the whole class, before the broad masses has taken up a position either of direct support of the vanguard or at least of benevolent neutrality towards it, would be not merely folly but a crime. And in order that actually the whole class, that actually the broad masses of the working people and those oppressed by capital may take up such a position, propaganda and education alone are not enough. For this, the masses must have their own political experience. Such is the fundamental law of all great revolutions, now confirmed with astonishing force and vividness, not only in Russia, but also in Germany. Not only the uncultured, often illiterate masses of Russia, but the highly cultured, entirely literate masses of Germany had to realize through their own painful experience the absolute impotence and spinelessness, the absolute helplessness and civility to the bourgeoisie, the utter vileness of the government of the Knights of the Second International, the absolute inevitability of the dictatorship of the extreme reactionaries, Kornilov in Russia, Kapp and Co. in Germany, as the only alternatives to a dictatorship of the proletariat in order to turn resolutely towards communism. Lenin. Secondly, to locate at any given moment the particular link in the chain of processes, which, if grasped, will enable us to keep hold of the whole chain and to prepare the conditions for achieving strategic success. The point here is to single out from all the tasks confronting the party the particular immediate task, the fulfillment of which constitutes the central point, and the accomplishment of which ensures the successful fulfillment of the other immediate tasks. The importance of this thesis may be illustrated by two examples, one of which could be taken from the remote past, the period of the formation of the party, and the other from the immediate present, the period of the NEP. In the period of the formation of the party, when the innumerable circles and organizations had not yet been linked together, when amateurish and pericurl order outlook of the circles were corroding the party from top and bottom, when ideological confusion was a characteristic feature of the internal life of the party, the main link and the main task in the chain of links and in the chain of tasks then confronting the party proved to be the establishment of an all-Russian illegal newspaper, Iskra. Iskra mentioned, why? Because under the conditions then prevailing, only by means of an all-Russian illegal newspaper was it possible to create a solid core of the party capable to create a, a solid core of the party capable of uniting the innumerable circles and organizations into one whole to prepare the conditions for ideological and tactical unity, and thus to build the for foundations for the formation of a real party. During the period of transition from war to economic construction, when industry was vegetating in the grip of disruption and agriculture was suffering from a shortage of urban manufactured goods, when the establishment of a bond between state industry and peasant economy became the fundamental condition for successful socialist construction, in that period, it turned out that the main link in the chain of processes, the main task among a number of tasks, was to develop trade. Why? Because under the conditions of the NEP, the bond between industry and peasant economy cannot be established except through trade. Because under the conditions of the NEP, production without sale is fatal for industry. Because industry can be expanded only by the expansion of sales as a result of developing trade. Because only after we have consolidated our position in the sphere of trade, only after we have secured control of trade, only after we have secured this link can there be hope can there be nay hope of linking industry with the peasant markets successfully fulfilling the other immediate tasks 
in order to create the conditions for building the foundations of socialist economy. Welcome in, Jack Bird. Great to see you, comrade. It is not enough to be a revolutionary and an adherent of socialism or a communist in general, says Lenin. One must be able, at each particular moment, to find the particular link in the chain which one must grasp with all one's might in order to keep hold of the whole chain and to prepare firmly for the transition to the next link. And, at the present time, this link is the revival of internal trade under proper state regulation. Trade, that is the link in the historical chain of events in the transitional forms of our socialist construction in 1921-22, which we must grasp with all our might. Lenin, both those quotes. Such are the principal conditions which ensure correct tactical leadership. Number six, reformism and revolutionism. What is the difference between revolutionary tactics and reformist tactics? Some think that Lenin, Leninism is opposed to reforms, opposed to compromises, and to agreements in general. This is absolutely wrong. Bolsheviks know, as well as anybody else, that in a certain sense, every little helps. That under certain conditions, reforms in general, and compromises and agreements in particular, are necessary and useful. Quote, to carry on a war for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie, says Lenin, a war which is a hundred times more difficult, protracted, and complicated than the most stubborn of ordinary wars between states, and to refuse beforehand to maneuver, to utilize the conflicts of interest, even though temporary, among one's enemies, to reject agreements and compromises with possible, even though temporary, unstable, vacillating, and conditional allies, is not this ridiculous in the extreme? Is it not as though, when making a difficult ascent of the unexplored and hitherto inaccessible mountain, we were to refuse beforehand ever to move in zigzags, ever to retrace our steps, ever to abandon the course once selected and to try others? Lenin. Obviously, therefore, it is not a matter of reforms or of compromises and agreements, but of the use people make of reforms and agreements. To a reformist, reforms are everything, while revolutionary work is something incidental, something just to talk about, mere eyewash. That is why, with reformist tactics under conditions of bourgeois rule, reforms are inevitably transformed into an instrument for strengthening that rule, an instrument for disintegrating the revolution. To a revolutionary, on the contrary, the main thing is revolutionary work and not reforms. To him, reforms are a byproduct of the revolution. That is why, with revolutionary tactics, under the conditions of bourgeois rule, reforms are naturally transformed into an instrument for strengthening the revolution, into a strong point for the further development of the revolutionary movement. The revolutionary will accept a reform in order to use it as an aid in combining legal work with illegal work to intensify, under its cover, the illegal work for the revolutionary preparation of the masses, for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. That is, the essence of making revolutionary use of reforms and agreements under the conditions of imperialism. The reformist, on the contrary, will accept reforms in order to renounce all illegal work. To thwart the preparation of the masses for the revolution and to rest in the shade of bestowed reforms. And in my own experience, I can't say about PSL or CPUSA, in my own experience, that is a serious problem in the Canadian Communist parties. Is that right there that they have, in fact, renounced that. That is the essence of reformist tactics. Such is the position in regard to reforms and agreements under the conditions of imperialism. The situation changes somewhat, however. After the overthrow of imperialism, 
under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Certain conditions, in a certain situation, the proletarian power may find itself compelled to temporarily to leave the path of the revolutionary reconstruction of the existing order of things and to take the path of its gradual transformation, the reformist path, as Lenin says in his well-known article. The importance of gold. The path of flanking movements of reforms and concessions to the non-proletarian classes in order to disintegrate these classes, to give the revolution a respite, to recuperate one's forces and prepare the conditions for a new offensive. It cannot be denied that, in a sense, this is a reformist path, but it must be borne in mind that there is a fundamental distinction here, which consists in the fact that, in this case, the reform emanates from the proletarian power. It strengthens the proletarian power. It procures for it a necessary respite, for its purpose is to disintegrate, not the revolution, but the non-proletarian classes. Under such conditions, a reform is thus transformed into its opposite. The proletarian power is able to adopt such a policy because, and only because, the sweep of the revolution in the preceding period was great enough and therefore provided a sufficiently wide expanse within which to retreat, substituting for offensive tactics the tactics of temporary retreat, the tactics of flanking movements. Thus, while formerly under bourgeois rule, reforms were a byproduct of revolution. Now, under the dictatorship of the proletariat, the source of reforms is the revolutionary gains of the proletariat. The reserves accumulated in the hands of the proletariat, consisting of these gains. Only Marxism, says Lenin, has precisely and correctly defined the relation of reforms to revolution. However, Marx, Marx, I don't know what that name was I just said. However, Marx, not Mox, was able to see <laughs> was able to see this relation only from one aspect, namely under the conditions preceding the first to any extent permanent and lasting victory of the proletariat, if only in a single country. Under those conditions, the basis of the proper relations was Reforms are a byproduct of the revolutionary class struggle of the proletariat. After the victory of the proletariat, if only in a single country, something new enters into the relation between reforms and re revolution. In principle, it is the same as before, but a change in form takes place, which Marx himself could not foresee, but which can be appreciated only on the basis of philosophy and politics of Marxism. After the victory, while still remaining a byproduct on an international scale, they, i.e. reforms, are in addition for the country in which victory has been achieved, a necessary and legitimate respite in those cases when, after the utmost exertion of effort, it becomes obvious that sufficient strength is lacking for the revolutionary accomplishment of this or that transition. Victory creates such a reserve of strength that it is possible to hold out even in a forced retreat, to hold out both materially and morally. Lenin. And there you have it. That's our chapter. Boom! Chapter 7. Done. What do we think? I would have been friends with Stalin. The Stalin guy. I think I'm, I think I'm kind of, I think I'm kind of, I think I'm becoming, wait, I feel, I feel something here. Wait, I feel like I'm becoming part of his personality cult. Foundations of Lemonism. Yeah, you, 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 you joke, Red Falcon, but if you had just heard me reading, you'd know that's nothing He's to joke about. Oh, really? Yep, big communist, big, big communist. Oh. <laughs> For example, the 